same as Cruz, and it would have been a real landslide against uh, him. But nevertheless, I mean, in, in reality, what does it really mean? If you look at the history of Iowa, it means nothing. I mean, how many different ways do we have to say the same thing, and how often will I have to say it? How often do we have to say the same thing? They've often picked people in Iowa in the caucuses that have gone on to lose. Too often, by the way. In fact, uh, more often than not, they've picked losers. So how much can you make of it? Whatever you want to make of it. You want to tell yourself you're a genius because you were behind this one, and go ahead, you're a genius. You want to tell yourself you bet on the wrong horse, go ahead, you bet on the wrong horse. The average American doesn't even know what's going on. That's all. The average American goes on with their daily life. They watch baseball. They look interested in the Super Bowl this Sunday. I know very intelligent people who are going to the Super Bowl. And I'll tell you, I was invited. I'm not going. Someone I know has <laughs> seats on the 50-yard line. Doc, you want to go? No. Family, I'm not going. I went last time in New Orleans. Remember, I walked out after the quarter time. Or I left. I was so bored. I had to leave. The, the peanuts and the corn and the... The beer, the swilling, the crazy eyes. It looked like the Roman arena to me. I mean, you want to watch sports, I'd rather watch it on TV. That's me. I mean, not many people would like to go. It's like a lifetime. I don't want to go. But the average American wants to go. They don't know about already what happened in Iowa. You say Iowa, they don't know what it is. The average American doesn't relate to Iowa. doesn't mean that then it's not there. It's one of a number of states. Most Americans don't know how many states are in the United States. They probably think France is part of the United States. Well, Mexico is certainly part of the United States, probably the 52nd state. They think Hawaii is part of Japan. You do a geography test of the average kid in high school, they don't know who anyone is. And, they, and a lot of them are going to vote, by the way. And their parents are just as smart as they are. They're interested in it being anti-war, black power, feminism, immigration, socialism. They say they're a student and that's their politics. They don't really know the ins and outs of all of this. And most of you don't either. And you'll over-identify in a category that doesn't even have meaning, in my opinion. So you're ready? We blew through two sets, and I haven't let, taken a call yet. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-728-SAVAGE. caucus is over now let's move on let's move on to the rest of america therefore render to caesar the things that are caesar's and to god the things that are god's what does it actually mean it's from matthew 22 17 21 for those of you who think i don't know the bible where they said to jesus is it lawful to pay taxes to caesar or not and he said why put me to the test you hypocrites show me the coin for the tax and they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is on this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. That's very interesting. And that's why I took umbrage at those who were trying to appeal both to the religion of the caucus goers and to the state of affairs in America at the same time. That's all. Simple as that. Let's go on to the callers. Let's see what's going on here. You know, there's something you don't know. Why do you think people stay in these campaigns even though they're losing and they can't win? What you don't know is the financial element involved in these campaigns. For example, if I had run for the, for the office just to make money, I could have made tens and tens of millions of dollars in campaign funds knowing I didn't have a chance to win, and I would have stayed in the race to the last second to collect even more money, and then I would have, like John Boehner does, tons of money after he's out of office to uh, disperse. Of course, you can't take it to your, for yourself. You go to jail for that. But there's, there are fortunes made in running for office in this country, and those who lose make fortunes that they then spend for years afterwards in ways you can pretty much you know, imagine. So there's so many elements to this that we're not talking about that need to be discussed. Let's take the calls, go through them, and start all over again. How's that? What now? I can, can we not do Trump all day long? I got already got three Trumps, one Rubio, one Cruz. Can we not do this? 
Okay, here we go. KCMO, Roger, you're on the Savage Nation. Yeah, Dr. Savage, uh, I'm glad you didn't take those other calls with Trump. My, my point is the graham leach Bliley Act, all Representative 3 Republicans, was the one that repealed Glass-Steagall. They deregulated the bankers' industry. Byron right. Can... L- let me explain what we're talking about. The Glass-Steagall Act... I describe this in great detail in Trickle Down Tyranny on pages pages 87 and 88. I don't want to read from it. It was passed in 1933 in order to spur a recovery from the Great Depression. And what it required was the banks be separated into commercial banking operations and investment banking operations. They were separated. And prior to Glass-Steagall, banks were permitted to loan money as well as to invest it and broker investments for their clients. And this led to their being dangerously over-leveraged and to one of the most disastrous effects of the stock market crash of 1929, which was the failure of the American banks. So after the great crash, they passed Glass-Steagall to separate the banks, right, and to regulate that. Then along comes Bill Clinton, who appoints as Treasury Secretary, Robert Rubin. Robert Rubin engineered the repeal of Glass-Steagall, And then the distinction between commercial and investment banks disappeared once again. And the stage was set for the crash of 08 that got Obama elected. Isn't that some, some, doesn't that summarize what you want to say? Yeah, pretty much. And that Mr. Graham was rewarded a vice president of the UBS worker uh, vice president job after he uh, represented. All right. I'm glad we're touching on this because there's a lot of subtlety to this. Because of the repeal of Glass Steagall by Bill Clinton. What's interesting is Hillary's running as an anti-establishment candidate. She has engineered, her and her husband engineered all of this. She engineered the Arab Spring and destroyed the world. And how she gets away with it is not bewildering. You can thank Fox News for that. I'd expect the cover-up from CNN and MSNBC. That, that's their stock and trade is cover-up and camouflage for Hillary Clinton and the socialist Islamist machine. But you'd think that Fox News would expose Hillary at every turn, that every time they'd say Hillary, they'd say her and her husband eliminated Glass-Steagall. Her and her husband caused the banking crash. Her and her husband caused the Arab Spring. She caused the Arab Spring, the worst secretary of state in the world. That's what should be said every time a name is mentioned. So what happened? After Clinton and Robert Rubin engineered the repeal of Glass-Steagall and the distinction between commercial and investment banks disappeared once again, the stage was set for the crash of 08 that got Obama elected. Okay? The difference between the great crash of 1929 and the crash of 08, which gave us current economic downturn, gave us the current economic downturn that got us Obama elected, is that the 08 meltdown was intentional, in my opinion. It was intentional. Big difference. Now, because of the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, And because banks are now permitted to engage in high-risk brokerage activities, including selling insurance, underwriting securities, they're hedging their risk through such strategies such as short selling and continuing to develop and trade extremely risky financial derivatives. So let me put it another way to you. We're being set up for an economic meltdown similar to the one that triggered the Great Depression. But this time it's going to occur on a global scale and it's unlikely that we'll be able to recover within even the next several decades once it happens. Glass-Steagall, look into it. It's in trickle-down tyranny, pages 87 and 88. And I think it's an important point come this election because the subtext for most people who vote on the Democrat side is uh, a distrust of big business, a distrust of the banks, and they think that their savior is Bernie the commie. I'll go into that at another time. He's a politician. He's always been a politician. If you have faith in him, you're a fool. If you actually have faith that he's going to do something different than the others, you're crazy. You'll get more of the same. You'll get the same nonsense. You'll get the rhetoric every day. You'll get the rhetoric about the left, the LGBT world. That's all you hear, but he'll do nothing to the banks because they control the presidency. Okay? You'll, you'll, get, um, the, you'll get what you get. WDRC, Daryl, welcome to the Savage Nation topic, please. Yeah, the uh, 2008 uh, economic collapse. Uh, a few years ago, I can't think of the gentleman's name right now, but uh, he was part of Bush's cabinet. I think he was the Treasury Secretary uh, from Goldman Sachs. And uh, he was on uh, British press uh, 
about three years ago, uh, a British uh, publication saying that the 2008 economic collapse was a result of Russia. Now, what does that mean? I don't understand what he was saying. He's passing the buck. It wasn't a result of Russia. It was engineered here in America to bring about Obama. Well, uh, if you remember in 2008... Um, All right, so what, what did Russia allegedly do to break our economy? Give it, give it to us in one line or less. Uh, they were trying to draw out uh, huge amounts of money. If you remember, uh, that was the reason why... Uh, they okay, this is not well thought out. Sorry. You, you, didn't, you came in with a half idea about the evils of Russia. Let me repeat what I said before. The dangers of Cruz, in my opinion, the biggest danger of Cruz is he's a complete fool when it comes to Russia. Why does he make Russia such an enemy, Ted Cruz? Where does this come from? It's a holdover from the Reagan era, and the same neocons who were in power with Ronald Reagan are waiting in the wings in the think tanks who are feeding Ted Cruz the same rubbish about the dangers of the big bear. And instead of recognizing that Russia is our only and natural ally against ISIS, and it was Russia who finally started to bomb ISIS, that finally encouraged Obama to, to do a, uh, take a few more baby steps, Russia is our natural ally, and in that sense, that's what makes Trump a far better choice for the presidency, for world stability. Cruz is totally off base on Russia. He has no idea what he's talking about. He is listening to the same fools who got us into Iraq 1 and Iraq 2, the same old-timers who are in these think tanks waiting to come back to power in a Cruz administration are misadvising him on Russia. Has anyone told you that yet? No, you haven't heard it. Well, I'm telling it to you. That's the danger, and you have to understand where this is coming from. Go look into the think tanks that got us into the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war. And look at the neocons. They're, they're basically policy advisors behind the scenes for, uh, for Ted, old Ted. And I like the name Ted, as you well know. It's an important name to me. It's a friendly name. My dog, Teddy. Ted. I like Ted. Everyone likes Ted. I never met a Ted I didn't like. And if he wins, I'm going to vote for him. But he's making a huge mistake. Will he win? Who knows? I don't know what's happening tomorrow. No one knows what tomorrow will bring. We hear that Trump's way ahead in uh, New Hampshire. Trump polling ahead in New Hampshire. You want to go into the nitty-gritty of that one. In New Hampshire, which holds its primary next Tuesday, Trump is polling 33% of the vote, three times as much as Cruz and Governor Kasich, his closest competitor in the New England state, according to the latest Real Clear Politics average of national polls. In South Carolina where evangelical voters also dominate the electorate, as they did in Iowa. Trump has captured 36% of the vote, 16 points higher than Cruz. Now, go explain that one to me. How is it that you've got two evangelically dominant, two states where evangelicals are dominant, Iowa and South Carolina, while in South Carolina, he's way ahead? How is that possible? What's the difference then, boys and girls, between the evangelical vote in South Carolina and the evangelical vote in Iowa. What's the difference? There must be a difference. There has to be a difference. And again, let's go back to my primary theme. I told you every one of my shows, if possible, has a theme. I pioneered that a few months ago, actually a few years ago. I try to keep the entire three hours focused on a simple theme because every, every organism needs a spine. A theme is a spine of a conversation. And the theme of today's show is that Iowa is a Democrat state primarily, and it's, it was Marx, Jefferson, and Jesus in Iowa who were dominating the discussion. Marx, Jefferson, and Jesus. Very interesting from my point of view. Maybe it's a little uh, esoteric for the average audience. I don't know. I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying most people don't want to get into the subtleties. For most people, it's a sporting event. It's this team versus that team. It's the A's versus the B's. It's John is a better batter than Bill. I'm in the favor of Bill. You're in the favor of John. Now let's go on to win the series against the Bees. You know, okay, that's, that's boring. How much can you talk about that? Right? I have two guys who work for me. Robert's in his 20s. He's a very intelligent young man. He, he knows what's going on in politics. He's also bored by this. He understands you know, what he cares about is who's going to run against who at the end of the day. But if you think that for nine months now I'm going to sit here analyzing the minutiae of every primary, you're mistaken. I'm not going to do it. I would rather put a gas pipe into my studio than do that. I'd rather take a pipe from the garage and my home studio and run it right into my studio, run a gas pipe in here, take a carbon monoxide poisoning, 
and call 911. If I, someone said to me, Michael, you have to talk every day for three 